be back with you guys here, all of you. This is home territory, I think, and it's good to be with you. You might wonder, well, how in the world did we get to Costa Rica in the first place? We've been running tours down there now for the last four years, I guess, but we've been doing ministry down there for more than, more than a dozen years. And uh, never had any thought that we would ever go to Costa Rica until uh, we uh, met this couple up here um, at my niece's wedding. And this couple is her husband's grandparents. And, and talking with them at the reception after the wedding, I got very, very fascinated. They had gone to Costa Rica on a short-term missions trip. And while they were there, they saw all these young women with kids and no husband in the scene and no way to support their kids. And they said, somebody ought to start a business down there to hire these young women and uh, so they'd have income. Well, you know what happens when you say somebody? And God says, how about you? And so they ended up coming home from that short-term missions trip. They ended up uh, remortgaging their home, coming out of retirement, took some, some savings that they had, and went to Costa Rica, and they started a business. And it's called Tico Electronics. And that business hires mostly young women who have children, and they've trained them to do very, very technical work. They were also at the same time teaching them English <laughs> and other skills. And so it's a very good business. Well, anyway, at the end of the time talking with these folks, they, they said, come to Costa Rica. We have a home down there. You can stay with us. And so like I usually do, when somebody invites us, I say, yeah, that would be great. But I never really expected that we would go. I mean, we didn't think about going to Costa Rica until um, we were trying to plan our, our 35th wedding anniversary trip. And we were thinking we were going to go to Mexico, but we started to book the tickets. So these tickets were just horrendously expensive that year for some reason. And now we know the reason. But on a lark, I said, well, Dave, why don't you try Costa Rica? We've been invited to go to Costa Rica. So he gets on, gets onto the uh, airline site, and he finds a ticket for $127. Well, it was one way, but return trip was only a little over 200 and so he immediately, he didn't even get off the, off the site, he booked it immediately, and so we said, okay, I guess we're going to Costa Rica for our anniversary trip. Well, that would have been just great, and we were looking forward to going, but that fall we were scheduled at the University of Minnesota, and this was the first year we were doing the ministry with this particular group at the University of Minnesota, and so we get back there, and the, the director, the founder of that ministry, is sharing with us all about how that ministry got started and what they do on the campus of, of the University of Minnesota and other campuses all around. And we were just thrilled to hear what they were doing. But in the process of sharing with us, he said, and we have a sister ministry in Costa Rica. Now, we had not told him we were going to Costa Rica, and so we heard, we have a sister ministry in Costa Rica, and we said, well, we are going to Costa Rica in just a couple of months. And he said, oh, I know Scott down there would love to have you speak. Would you be willing to teach? And so we kind of went, well, yeah, what else do you do on your anniversary trip but do ministry, right? And so I was thinking, well, maybe we could do it the first week, and we'd still have some time left after that. Well, <laughs> Dave is talking with Scott in Costa Rica, and Scott's going, I really, really want you to come for a couple of weekends in a row because his church met on Saturday nights and whatever, and he was doing outreach to the campus. And so we finally said, okay, we'll do that. And, and you know, it wasn't exactly what we wanted, but we said, we'll do that. No sooner had he hung up talking with Scott and confirmed those dates, the airline calls, and says, we're gonna have to change your tickets. And Dave's going, but you can't do that. I just booked for time that we're supposed to be speaking down there. And he says it, it would work if you would get us out of Grand Junction instead of flying out of Denver. And so the lady goes and she checks and she comes back and says, that'd be $800 a piece. And Dave said, don't change it. Don't do that. And then she, then she says, just a minute, let me go check again. 
And she comes back and she says, I got you going out of Grand Junction, no extra charge. So that saved us driving to Denver, getting a hotel and, and all of that. So we said, thank you, Lord. So that's how we got to Costa Rica in the first place. We ministered at the University of Costa Rica as well as some local churches and so on over, over several years period of time. While we were down there, we met Scott um, on the uh, left up there and, and a Costa Rican lady by the name of Patricia. And she, she and Scott became very good friends of ours over the years. Patricia uh, took us on tours and Scott arranged for the creation seminars. And so here, here we were doing ministry in Costa Rica. Here's Scott translating for Dave. Scott's been down there as a missionary for many, many, many years, uh, ministering to the University of Costa Rica students. And uh, he has a campus house just three blocks from the campus and so on. And so he, he and now his family are very faithful. Over the years, as we've been going down, we've been able to minister in churches down there, at schools, public schools even. And the interesting thing is, in the public schools, this particular school, we said, well, you know, we have a Bible message along with science, and the teachers told us, go right ahead. You can give a, you can give a gospel message right there in the public schools. And so there's a, a lot more openness there. I love the kids. We just had a great time with them. Well, Scott ended up coming up to our, our building, our, our institute at one point, to give training to teach creation. And so here is, here is Scott. One day he was translating for Dave down there, and they, Dave was you know, getting a little long-winded and running out of time. And so partway through the program, he said, Scott, you know the program, finish it up. And so we're seeing multiplication down there that way. Scott's wife actually translated for another one of our, our associates during this last uh, trip down there. So that's kind of fun to see that multiplying. <coughs> Patricia and, and us, uh, as we were in Costa Rica, Patricia wanted to go see some things. Now, she hardly ever gets to go anywhere, but somehow when we come, she wants to go exploring. And so she drives us all around and we go exploring. And that's how we got started with the idea of doing the creation tours because we were going all around. She took us down to the Osa Peninsula down by Corcovado National Park, which if any of you know Costa Rica, that's on a lot of people's bucket list that want to go to Costa Rica. It has some of the highest biodiversity in the, in the world in one little location. And so she took us down. Her brother has a farm down there and a beautiful house. And so she took us down there. We got to see that. And we said, we want to take some other people here. This is just too good to keep to ourselves. And so we started doing these creation tours of Costa Rica. And uh, we have a Costa Rican tour coordinator that goes with us, as well as a naturalist guide who's been licensed and trained by Costa Rica. Now, some of the guides we've had in the past have been creationists. Others have been abolitionists. I think this year we get a creationist again, which I'm really, really happy for. And uh, last year we had a creationist guide, and so we were able to work really closely. The first time we did it, we had an evolutionist who was our guide. That was okay. He knew the animals and plants, and he was very, very open to what we had to teach. And so we got to train him, really, as we were going along also, which was really neat. And so we started doing these Costa Rican creation adventures. So this is the commercial, okay? If you want to come with us next spring, get your name on the list pretty quick because we are expecting it's going to fill up this year. Uh, we're doing the, the, the creation program for several creationist organizations. That uh, program, this program actually uh, was, I guess, instigated by by a guy back in Minnesota who came on the trip with us last year and he said that would make a great program for the TCCSA, uh, Twin Cities Creation Science Association program. So we'll be doing it there too. But uh, we'd encourage you to come. There is so much in Costa Rica that you can learn about God's creation. And I think, you know, there's stuff to learn, but even more than that, stuff that is so fantastically beautiful and so complex that it just draws your heart to worship the Lord. And that's really what it's about, isn't it? It's about worshiping God and about sharing Him with other people. 
And, and that's one of the benefits of the tours is the fellowship that you have along the tour. So we want to encourage you with that. Dave is going to come now and he's going to share with you some of the evidences we see in Costa Rica of creation and the fall and the flood and the dispersion at the Tower of Babel. If you're interested, if you're not already in our mailing list, we do publish a newsletter. It comes out once every two months. And you can print your name on that, uh, that the clipboard's coming around. We'll be happy to send that to you. And afterwards, we have a whole bunch of books over there if, you, if you'd like to take a look at some books on creation. Okay. Oh, you don't Thank you, Mary Jo. <laughs> it's always neat to see how the Lord works out different things. The details we have never planned or anticipated he's got them already worked out and that exciting that that's that's what I really enjoy uh, uh, serving the Lord okay so anyhow evidence for designing Costa Rica first a biblical uh, framework for this particular program right here is the creation that's a good place to start isn't it in the beginning uh, there's the fall, though, that's not a good place to start, but it's part of it. Uh, then there was a flood, and after the flood, there's the Tower of Babel and the disbursement, isn't there? That's our, our framework, and we see that fairly well, um, uh, you might say, cataloged right there in Costa Rica. And so uh, Genesis 1, God says, He created things after their own kind, stated ten times. What does that mean? Not one kind changing into another kind, right? And so in Costa Rica, boy, do we see some beautiful kinds of creatures that he has made. We see that. He also says in the scripture uh, uh, that uh, he, not only the distinct kinds we're going to be looking for, but he also tells us that, uh, okay, he created this entire earth, not in vain. He created it to be inhabited. Well, you know what? When you go to Costa Rica, you see so many ecological niches there. Uh, it is quite a diverse country, and every little niche has these communities, and within the community, even a tree, you end up with an, another ecological niche just in one tree and a whole uh, bunch of life organizations I'll get used to this uh, clicker here before too long we find tremendous biodiversity in Costa Rica okay uh, that's a uh, that square is Colorado okay basically Colorado you could put the entire country of Costa Rica in only western Colorado so it's not a big country, is it? If you don't know that when we're tra traveling around, it's so diverse, all the different places and different places we can go. Uh, but it only has one tenth of one percent of the Earth's ma uh, land mass, and yet it has a total five percent of the entire world's biodiversity. All right, and so that's what makes it so unique. Uh, there are over 490 per, uh, species of uh, invertebrates, 200 species of, uh, of uh, you might say, uh, non-insect. Well, you, a lot of you really love insects, right? <laughs> Do the subtraction, there's a lot of insects there. But you know what, there's a huge amount of wonderful design, even in the insects, too. And, uh, but we're not talking that much about it. 12,000 species of vascular plants, well, 1,400 species of orchids alone, 1,400 species. And it's amazing what you actually see. When you look at the plants and the vegetation, it is just amazing <laughs> what kind of uh, uh, diversity you have there. Uh, many vertebrates as well there. We have mammals, 250 species. But why this great diversity, I might ask? Why is it? Well, first of all, it's a unique location. All right, you'll see that in a second. It also has 
varied topography in this little country. And there are special geologic processes happening which all work together, you might say, for varying climatic zones. It's working together to be able to do the uh, different ecosystem and all kinds of specialized niches, okay? A niche is where you might have one little tiny thing, like a spring in a desert. That's a niche, right? And you'll see different things growing there than what you might see 20 feet away. But we see that in Costa Rica. Now, first of all, look at Costa Rica there. At the point of that arrow is Costa Rica. Nicaragua is just right above that. Uh, and Panama, right below there, okay? Now, notice that you have oceans on both sides of that narrow country. Ocean there. Beautiful beaches, okay? And for those who love beaches, <laughs> there's the place, <laughs> all right? Beautiful place for uh, oceans, etc. And But also we have all the way from the beaches up to thir almost a 13,000 foot peak, all right? And uh, so that is an amazing diversity that you're gonna get just from the altitudes and the uh, beach zones as well. Also in Costa Rica, there's a lot of plate tectonics, moving plates. It's at the junction of a couple of different plates. I don't know if that's gonna show up that well. But the Caribbean plate and the Cocos plate come together. There's a Nazca or Nazca plate coming in here too. That's a lot of plates. Okay, you can almost set the dinner table with it. <laughs> But what you're understanding here is when plates are moving, things are getting pushed around and being pushed up, right? And as you know, plate tectonics is also very much instrumental in some of the volcanism all around the world, isn't it? And Costa Rica being the same. So you see several of those red spots. Uh, what are those? Volcanoes six or seven active ones, okay? Mm. I love it. I love to see those active volcanoes as well. Now, I might be a little weird that way, but it's okay. Uh, I can do it. Arenal in 2006 uh, erupted. You can just see the lava coming off of that, right? And, uh, and then we have a Poaz volcano as well, which is very close to the capital city of, uh, of uh, Costa Rica. And I believe POAS is the one that actually dusted uh, 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 the former president, uh, uh, John Kennedy, when he visited the country. Uh, so there was a volcanic ash there. And uh, POAS, from this vantage point, you can see a lot of the crater of POAS volcano. And uh, we got those pictures one year. The next year, we couldn't go there because the volcano erupted and blew the observation point right off the map. Well, but we knew this year there was activity. They know ahead of time. There's nobody hurt. They know that because there's probably you can actually predict if there's some activity going on and you know not to go there. All right. Uh, I wanted to go there regardless. But uh, so we went uh, this last year. Uh, we went to uh, Irasu, a volcano. Gorgeous place. Very, really interesting layers. Uh, and keep in mind, when uh, Charles Darwin went up the coast of South America, he saw volcanic layers, and he said, oh, must have taken eons of time for those to have formed, right? So we got to Costa Rica, what do we see? Layers, wow. Eons of time? Not necessarily. Anybody who's familiar with Mount St. Helens knows in one day you can get those volcanic layers buried and so it doesn't take long does it charles darwin didn't know that where he was from they didn't have volcanoes all right so irrational <laughs> volcano just a wonderful spot to visit now because of the volcanoes this is arenal uh, in the background it has caused tremendous tremendously you might say uh enriched soils Plants really do well in volcanics. I don't know if you know that, right? Really do well. And uh, so you see green all over, especially where you have the moisture. 
beautiful green, uh, the hills and the flowers and everything in and around that area, the entire spot in Costa Rica, at, at least where we take the tours. Gorgeous beauty all over. And amazing, amazing design. Okay? Uh, monarch butterflies you're already familiar with, right? Tremendous design. Their migration all the way from Canada all the way down to Mexico. A butterfly. It migrates, right? And how does he know how to do it? He doesn't do it in one generation. It takes him two generations to go down there. And then the Methuselah generation goes all the way back up. How did they pass down that information? In Costa Rica, we see monarch butterflies too. But interesting, they don't migrate as much. I think they like it where they're at. <laughs> All right. it's, a, it's a beautiful spot to be. You know, people said, oh, you said monarch butterflies, and you always use that for evidence of design? Yeah, I do. I think we should look at what God has made and see the evidences of his creation, evidences of design, and glorify him as our God. Isn't that what it says in uh, Romans? For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen. Did you catch that? Just look. All right. Clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even as he turned, well, I already said that, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. I get to so many different universities, and I have run into people there that try to tell me there's no God. There's no God. That's what they tell me. We have Richard Dawkins out there saying, things are too imperfect. There can't be a God. Mary Jo and I were at the University of Minnesota last fall. We ran into a guy that says, things are just too perfect. There can't be a God. <laughs> I was, that left me scratching my head for a long time. <laughs> but you know, when, I think this verse is kind of telling us if we don't acknowledge God as God, we become foolish, don't we? Professing to be wise, they became fools. I don't want to be called a fool by God. I don't think you do either, do you? Okay? I want to open my eyes. I want to see the design. And yes, even though those on the university campus will tell me, you can't tell if something was designed. It might have been millions of years of, of mutations, which are accidents, coupled with natural selection, to produce all these different features that we're calling design. Well, did any, would anybody say that painting came as a result of an explosion in a paint factory? Accidents don't produce those kind of things, do they? So I believe we can see design if we just look for it. I already said there are a lot of vascular plants and 1,400 species of orchids, right? Do you realize, first of all, if you are given an orchid, don't put it in a glass of water to give it plenty of moisture for the roots. That'll kill your orchid because orchids breathe through the roots. They breathe through the roots. So you just keep them moist, okay? That's all you have to do. And not only that, orchids have seeds. But the seeds don't have enough in nutrients in it in order to be able to germinate. Well, that sounds like poor design. No, God has created you and me and everything else to work together, hasn't he? Okay, we're not an island unto ourselves. We're to work together. Well, the, every one of the species of orchids have its unique fungus. It's a symbiotic relationship, okay? And the fungus is actually, uh, well, you know, it uh, does well inside the orchid there with the seed pods. And not only that, but it provides the nutrients for the seeds in order for them to germinate. 
every orchid with a distinct fungus. Now, how did that happen by accident, huh? That doesn't sound like an evolutionary plan, does it? Not at all. Okay, butterflies and moths, there are more than, I mean, 9,000, I believe, species of butterflies and moths. I love those things. I, I could spend almost a month just photographing them. I, I love to take pictures and uh, all the different ones that I see. Beautiful, all kinds of, my favorite, of course, is that blue morpho. Hey, have you ever heard Bill Browning talk about the blue morpho? Huh? This is where I first heard about the blue morpho butterfly was from Bill Browning. Okay? He was doing a program at our family camp, and uh, Jesus, the light of the world, I believe is the title of the name of that program, wasn't it? Jesus, the light of the uh, world. And uh, wonderful job. Thank you again, Bill. <laughs> But he was talking about the blue morpho. And some of the things, we had him even write an article about it. But do you realize the blue morpho butterfly is not blue? What do you mean? See it right there, it's blue. No, actually, the uh, wings of that blue morpho butterfly are made up of thousands of tiny little scales. Thousands of them. And each uh, one of those scales doesn't have any color on its own. Did you know that? In fact, there it is. It's kind of colorless. So how does it get the blue? It's colorless. So that's a, that doesn't make sense. You know, God made butterflies with pigment. He's made flowers with pigment. So if you see a red flower, the only thing that's reflected is basically the red from the light spectrum, right? But from this, there's no pigment whatsoever on that. And by the way, notice that the uh, underside of the butterfly has a very different uh, look to it, doesn't it? That is the same butterfly, by the way. All right? Well, not the same one, but it's the same species. Same thing, underside versus the top side. All right, so look at those scales. One thing exciting about those scales is that it is made up of tiny little ridges they kind of look like Christmas trees, right? They're little ridges. And uh, we call them laminae, don't we? All right? But the thing about those ridges is that the light can come in and it can actually be concentrated coming out. It's what is called uh, constructive interference. And that takes what looks like just colorless and causes intense color to be uh, reflected through. It'll actually cancel out some wavelengths and it'll actually enhance some of the other wavelengths. All right. <laughs> now, there are millions of those laminae, okay? And each one of those, here's what Bill Browning said when he wrote that article for us, they complete the spacing of a laminae must be precisely controlled to a certain fraction of the wavelength, one eighth. Approximately 1.4 million layers of these laminae are meticulously arranged with incredible accuracy on the wings. Wow. <coughs> and while I'm thinking about Bill Ronning, thanks for serving. Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship. We feel like our, this particular fellowship is almost like a sister ministry to ours over there in Grand Junction, right? Yeah. Uh, we really are. <laughs> Anyhow, but think about that with those lamina. In the blue morpho is not blue, but that intense color comes out that particular way. Isn't that an amazing God we serve? Who could put them in such place so meticulously? unless there's a creator God. Mutations? Natural selection? <clears throat> uh, doesn't seem to cut it, does it? No, I don't think evolution's got a good explain, explanation for it. I remember after Bill talked about it, and I knew I was going to Costa Rica, I wanted to see a blue morpho so badly. So Mary Jo began praying that I'd see a blue morpho up close. Well, that's pretty close, isn't it? 
<laughs> answered prayer. Well, God, God goes overboard with his prayer sometimes, answering prayer. I got to see one really up close. <laughs> oh, it <laughs> oh, was so much fun watching. We saw them all over Costa Rica, okay? And so it was so much fun being able to experience uh, the glory of God. Uh, and think about Jesus, the light of the world, along with it, right, Bill? <laughs> Anyhow, there are over 250 species of mammals that you can see, and bats make up about half of them. Well, it's a good thing, because they have a lot of insects, right? <laughs> All right? Uh, but bats do. Let me talk about a couple of mammals. One of them is the sloth. All right? And um, sloths kind of move about as fast as a young child does when he's told to eat his spinach. <laughs> Not very fast, okay? Anyhow, he just barely moves along. And he hangs upside down from the limbs. Now, some of them make good pets, okay? And this is at a sloth refuge. Uh, this was uh, left orphaned, and uh, they took him in at the sloth refuge. And, but look at those huge claws on that guy. Well, if you go to the museum, what do they tell you huge claws are for? Ripping flesh, <laughs> right? So Jurassic Park, there you go. No, those particular claws are well constructed. They're actually, you look at the uh, sloth in action, and they can lock those claws in place and hang upside down on a limb and go to sleep. Isn't that neat? I'd like to do that occasionally too, huh? But uh, well, the sleep part especially. Uh, there, there are almost 900 species of birds there. And I could talk about dozens of these things. And I would like to say my favorite bird is, no, I've got a bunch of favorite birds down there. All right. I, I do, I think everybody appreciates that scarlet mackerel. Okay? T intense beauty of that thing. And it can be this big. You know why I really like them? I can see them. <laughs> I can see them. And they have intense coloration as well. So way up in the tree you see them, they're cracking the almonds and that kind of stuff and even uh, avocados. Uh, so I get to see them. Uh, like that one. That's a nesting couple right there. All right? Scarlet macaws mate for life. This is an interesting thing. If uh, one of them perishes by some accident, and by the way, they can live for 65 to 80 years, that's a long, good long life on those macaws. Uh, if one of them dies, the other one will not get another mate. They will stay single. What advantage is that for evolution if evolution proceeds by mutations and then natural selection, the survival of the fittest? Also, evolution is supposed to really be enhanced by what? Passing your genes, right? On to and getting more and more and more uh, baby macaws. No? It goes exactly opposite what you would expect from an evolutionary perspective, wouldn't it? Yeah, of course they would grab another mate, that for sure. Now, it's interesting because once in a while, skull and macaws will pick up parasites. What's it going to do? It eats the sap from poisonous uh, cedar. Poisonous cedar sap. How did it learn to do that to kill the parasites? Doesn't God tend to his animals really nicely? And by the way, if it eats too much unripe food, that can poison him too, okay, or her. So what to do there? It goes to the riverbank and digests clay at the river. And that takes care of the problem with the unripe fruit. What? Yeah, God thinks of everything, doesn't he? And he imparts it into his creation. Ah, oh, look at that beautiful Quetzal. This is a prize by uh, photographers around the world, okay? And this is the one of the few pictures I didn't take. <laughs> I got some Quetzals, I got some pictures. 
but nothing to really show you its grandeur. Uh, beauty, is, to me, is an evidence of design, isn't it? <laughs> what a beautiful bird that one is. Uh, so what does Charles Darwin and the rest of the evolutionary uh, stronghold think about beauty? It's a mating advantage, right? That's what they say. Beauty is a mating advantage. The prettiest birds are the ones that's going to attract the mates, right? Etc. The strongest male. Well, why are both the male and the female scarlet macaws the same color? All right, that's number one. And is it really the key? Is it the mantra of evolution as a mating advantage, and that's how everything proceeds, okay? Well, it turns out, as you look at it, think about a peacock. Think about a peacock here. Beautiful, stately peacocks, right? Uh, that was a mating advantage. It attracted the females, right? Well, no, there were 260 observations done in this major study the splendid males did not win the attention of the females. Even they found out that uh, those without the color, those with they trimmed the tail feathers off of the peacock, had the same rate of uh, reproduction and attracting their mate. Albino peacocks, the same way. Shoots that right down, doesn't it? All right, another one of my favorite birds is another big bird, and I like it because I can see it, okay? And, but I can see a lot of birds, and I take uh, nice uh, pictures and blow, it up, blow them up. That is a type of a toucan, okay, of that family that toucans are in. A fire-billed uh, aricari, okay? Look at that gorgeous bill. Or look at the bill on the... Uh, other toucans, the more common ones, okay? Look at that beautiful bill and the beautiful colors. Aha! You know, Darwin looked at that and said it's a mating advantage. That bill is about 30 to, uh, excuse me, yeah, 30 to 50 percent of the size of the bird, and the bird's about this big. That's a big bill, isn't it? You'd think, boy, that thing must weigh a ton. No, it doesn't. It's only 5% of the body weight of the bird. It's extremely lightweight, okay? So Darwin, we saw it two counts. He said, aha, mating advantage. Right? No? No, and hey, come. Yeah, I guess you all want to see that picture again. Okay. It's a mating advantage. No? Here's what National Geographic knew. News said after a bunch of research, they found out that here the brilliantly colored bills of toucans aren't just eye candy. They're not. Rather, they play an essential role in helping the bird control their temperature. Blood is pumped up different distances up into that bill for both heating and cooling. This is an amazing thermal regulation system. All right. And it happened by accident? No way. And it's a, it's a great design. And uh, I wish National Geographic would say, isn't that amazing? Wonderful creator God we have that takes care of his creation. Wouldn't it be neat if he, they would say that? No, they don't. I love hummingbirds. I've been in places there in Costa Rica, the hummingbirds are just darting all around. They're, they don't hurt you, don't worry about it. I mean, they're all around, a place of maybe 500 of them. <gasps> Thank you, Lord, for hummingbirds, really. Uh, anyhow, think about the hummingbird, though. Do you realize it could, come back, this little guy doesn't work very well. <laughs> it skips real quick. Do you know the wings beat from 50 to up to 200 and even more times per second? That's fast, okay? That's fast. That's some faster than some of us scoop in ice cream, okay? <laughs> that generates a lot of heat, doesn't it? All right? Also, if you heard somebody say, oh, I eat like a bird, 
Ask them, is that a hummingbird you eat like? It actually sips twice its body weight in nectar every day. Uh, excuse me, yeah, yeah, per day. Uh -huh. So somebody my size uh, might uh, sip in uh, 300 pounds of food. <laughs> or more. Anyhow, uh, anyhow. But wait a minute, if it sips in that much per day, how does it do it? It's not just stick it in, draw it out, stick it in, draw it out. That tongue works more like a micro pump. It's a pumping system. That's great mechanics right here, okay? Tremendous design. Anybody who's an engineer would notice the design of that thing. It is composed of two long, narrow tubes that unzip in segmented flaps when in contact with nectar, okay? Then the flaps retract, pump, boom, right? They retract to pump the nectar in less than 1 20th of a second in rapid succession, thousands of times each day. And guess what? That pump doesn't wear out. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Think about it. All of that food that it's eating, right? All that food. What's it do with all that food? It's got to burn it, right? There's a lot of uh, calories needed for all this much flapping of its wings, right? Don't you think a poor old hummingbird is going to uh, basically burst into flame? Wouldn't you think that with all that heat, metabolic and frictional heat? No. The airflow from flapping wings helps cool the outside of that bird, and the heartbeat is this, 500 to 1,200 times per minute. If you had a heartbeat like that, they'd send you to the hospital right now. <laughs> All right? Or you wouldn't make it to the hospital. Forget it. And a respiration, 250 times per minute. And that helps cool this particular bird. That's a unique design. Okay? I think if we open our eyes, we're going to be seeing this kind of design all over, aren't we? And uh, rather than trying to uh, attribute it to evolution. You know, if you look at the fossil record, uh, hummingbirds have always been hummingbirds. Did you know that? When they actually find fossil hummingbirds. And I love this quote here. The amazing thing about this fossil is that it's essentially a modern hummingbird. My mind is a little blown. <laughs> and then I like the next one too. Where the whole hovering tribe came from, of hummingbirds, remains up in the air. <laughs> I love their humor. <laughs> All right. The bats are another interesting creature there. It's a half of the mammal species, okay, like I said. And you guys know about the design of a bat. I don't have to tell you about it. It's uh, the way it can, uh, uh, the, the sonar, all this kind of good stuff. The flight, the intricate detail. You might have known there's a something with a bat trying to catch a type of a moth and the moth actually has these maneuvers and can actually escape the bat. <laughs> uh, it's an amazing type systems but and you say hmm, those bats amazing int intricate flight too and but when you look at the fossil record of the bats guess what you find 1,000 fossil bats found more than that now not one of them is intermediate not one shows how a bat could have evolved from an insectivore like they think it happened. All right? Anyhow, you'd think that with this type of a flight and uh, the way they can camouflage and all this, they don't really have too many animals or natural enemies. But they do. There are two of them right here in this picture. All right? Two natural enemies. And I didn't realize it when I was taking this picture that I was getting both of them at the same time. I didn't notice it until I started looking at my picture. All right? So what do you see? The yellow in the background? That's a viper. That's a viper. In the foreground, you see a big spider, don't you? And the only reason you're seeing it is because I blew up my picture like this. So you can see those, and I didn't even realize it when I first took that picture, what I had. But anyhow, vipers are a natural enemy. 
but it also has a tremendous amount of design to it. Did you know that? Tremendous design on the Viper. Uh, the fangs, you know, it's going to inject uh, poison, right? Uh, venom. The fangs are actually fold back up into the roof of its mouth. It's an interesting system. And is that, I guess so it's not biting himself, okay? Biting his lip all the time. Uh, and then there's something else amazing about that Viper. It has infrared imaging capability. Infrared is heat imaging, okay? Imaging uh, a heat. And it works like this system, it's just sensors on both sides of the head. The system basically works like binocular vision. And his vision, just by heat, is probably better than our eyes are when we're actually seeing something. Okay? There they are. Uh, those, that particular viper can detect two one thousandths of a degree of temperature change. That, that and that, that's how it can zero in on exactly what it wants, okay? And its favorite food happens to be, not people, I'm glad for that, hummingbirds and bats, okay? <laughs> that's what he likes to eat. And, uh, of course, the hummingbird with all that heat, I'm sure, is uh, probably going to attract one of these guys. So, uh, I just want to let you know, uh, that particular viper, uh, I was amazed to see that thing. And I, I might have wanted to go lean against that tree. I'm good about leaning on things, okay? But uh, uh, no, you don't want to do that. Uh, but this is on the other side of the island, or not the island, of the country. We don't go there too much uh, there, uh, uh, for several different reasons there. But the vipers there, is you see those over there a whole lot more, okay? And, uh, but I've always, in the last four years, I haven't even... I think I've seen one snake, and it wasn't a venomous type, okay? But the thing is, vipers are extremely fun to look at. That particular one, it comes in several varieties of colors. Bright yellow, did you see? And an orange variety, and a white variety. All right? All those. And it's amazing design on the viper. So even on something that you might use to say, this represents the fall, all right? Serpent, right? Satan and the serpent. This represents the fall. Even they have wonderful design features, okay? And uh, the other thing I mentioned was the spider, wasn't it? Now, the spiders aren't necessarily going to eat the bats. Uh, it might, the little tiny finch, it might, okay? But the thing about that particular spider uh, the golden, uh, basically, uh, orb spider. Uh, it's a big spider, but you know what? If it bit you, it's not going to hurt you. A little bit, maybe, but not much. No, just uh, hardly anything. But the thing that's really neat about that is the strength of its web. And it's the web where a hummingbird might get caught in, okay? Uh, and that's... Uh, not too good for the uh, hummingbird. But they've actually now taken the spider web and made, that's a gold vest out of the golden web a spider. Okay. It's in a museum. Wow. Uh, but the interesting thing about that particular uh, uh, thing, notice what they said about it here. I'll get you, I, I don't know if I'll ever get these to this. But, uh, Notice Costa Rica bulletproof golden orb. You know what they're trying to do with that spider web? Is make a bulletproof vest out of the silk. Why? Because that silk is extremely strong. Spider silk is five times or even more than steel. Twice as elastic as steel, okay? Uh, or as nylon, and yet it remains completely waterproof. This is an amazing material. It sounds like a great thing to have a t-shirt made out of, right? Uh, but um, why? Why is it so strong? Well, first of all, when you look at a strand of spider silk, 
It's not a single strand. It is actually woven together into multiple cords, but it looks like one strand. This is under high magnification, and you see the weaving factory at the backside of a spider. I used to always hate spiders. Now I dislike them, but, but I have a great appreciation for them. When I see that weaving factories don't happen by accident, right? That does not look like something that mutations and natural selection will produce whatsoever. In the marine organisms, many different types. I like, of course, the whales. I like the dolphins. I like all those creatures, right? And um, we uh, take people uh, snorkeling, okay, on the tour. And they love it. <laughs> and um, frequently, we have a whole bunch of a pot of chasing our boat jumping in and out of the water and what a show they put on we love it and uh but the interesting thing is the design of a dolphin i've talked about design of a dolphin many many years okay uh, for instance it's a water mammal it needs to keep warm right it, down there it's not quite so hard but if you want to swim up in the northern northern waters or in the deeper water it's very cold so how does it keep warm well, he's got a thick layer of blubber that surrounds the inside of him, okay? Thick layer of blubber, and that keeps him warm. But he can't take his thick layer of blubber off. So he, get, he would get too hot when he's swimming hard or else swimming in warmer water. And so what happens is you look at the dorsal fin of the dolphin, and it acts just exactly like the radiator of your automobile, okay? And what that does is the blood is pumped up into it, has a couple of different vessels, and there's a transfer going on in there, and the temperature now, once the blood gets to the perfect temperature, it goes back in, cools down the rest of the body system. All right? Now, do radiators happen by accident? No, neither did this, right? So it's amazing. Here's what people who want to deny God say, in fact, this is a magazine that's committed to what's called the worldview of naturalism. I think you know what that is, most of you. That is that everything can be and should be explained only through naturalistic processes with no God involved whatsoever. Are you with me? That's what naturalism says. It's a worldview, no God type worldview. But Discover Magazine is committed to the philosophy or religion of naturalism, okay? And, he, and they say it this way because they never use the word design. They won't use God. They say, by all rights, life in the sea should leave a dolphin, dolphin baked, crushed, and sterile. This graceful mammal avoids such a fate only by slipping through the loopholes in the laws of physiology. Now that sounds pretty uh, scientific, doesn't it, Phil? Huh? Yeah, it does. But did they did they really say anything? No. <laughs> they just spouted some things and makes thing makes you think they've got it covered, right? <laughs> no, no. There's no explanation whatsoever in that. Uh, you know, we could talk a whole evening about the different design features of the. Uh, um, of the dolphin. Okay, here's some of it right here. They have a special diving physiology. They can dive one, almost 1,800 feet deep. They come up real quickly and they don't get the bends and all that kind of stuff that a diver would, right? Uh, why aren't they crushed? It's because of the system that they have, okay? First of all, the heart rate slows, the blood shunts, there's a lot of myoglobin, myoglobin. Uh, they have echolocation and echo signature recognition can actually tell the difference between a dime and a quarter under the water or under the sand. Pretty good system. I can't do that. Um, the jaw gives a greater capacity for hearing. And how did that extra bone evolve just by accidents, right? How did all that happen? Um, 
The inner ear, ear is also encased in a separate bone that had to evolve. It can actually have binocular and monocular vision. So they have a special ability to see both in dim and bright light, especially that second uh, light reflecting layer, kind of like a uh, tiger eye. Okay? Amazing. All these features about that thing. Uh, 225 species of reptiles alone. Uh, of course, uh, I like the Jesus Christ lizard. That's his name. It can actually run across water. Right? Run right across water. Anyhow. <laughs> You think you move fast when you're running, huh? <laughs> now, 20 steps per second. <laughs> That's amazing. We enjoy watching those things. And uh, crocodiles, there's a spot we get to visit, especially you can see the crocodiles in the river. And I think they like to take tours there. I think that's what they feed the crocodiles with. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, crocodiles eat fish, mostly. That's most of what they eat. Uh, they may uh, get an animal that gets too close, okay? And I'm not going to get too close, I can tell you. But uh, big old crocodiles there. But you realize that when it eats all that fish, it lives both in brackish water, which is kind of the salt and monkey, and uh, salt water, it can go out into the ocean, although they don't, these don't really venture out into the ocean much. But interesting. What do they do with all that salt? What do they do about it? Well, they have special glands just underneath the eyes that actually <laughs> concentrate that salt and get rid of it. Unique design, isn't it? They, that's not the only thing that does it, okay? They're not the only ones that eliminate salt. You look at some of the trees, the mango trees. Mm -hmm. My wife loves visiting the mangroves kind of going with the boat up and see so many different birds, see so many interesting things. But you realize mangoes also, they have, they're in as brackish water, they get all the salt water coming up into the structure. What happens? It's concentrated in special little uh, cells in the leaves, and then guess what? They drop the leaves very regularly and gets rid of the salt. God, God has something in mind for all those guys, really. He really does. All right? And uh, so, visiting mangroves, great. That's one of the seeds. When one of those uh, things fall down for, off of the tree, what's going to happen? Shoom, stick right in that bud. And then a new mangrove starts. Right? That's a great uh, way of doing it. Shorebirds also eliminate salt. Or, and I would say, uh, ocean going uh, birds, etc. Some of the herons do. Uh, this is a blue heron, or a green-backed heron is what that one is. Uh, interesting. It eliminates salt, yes, but it also goes fishing. I love that bird. I like to fish. This, fit, this bird will actually pick up a pebble or something else, drop it in the water. It attracts minnows. Then the bird gets This, this is a tool using bird, isn't it? I uh, wonder how we learned to do that. Uh, interesting. The bee eater is a bird that I, that's interesting. It likes to eat bees and wasps, etc. Uh, why doesn't it get stung? Well, it knows where to grab the thing first, okay? And then I like this particular sign, sign here. It says, um, instructions for bee eating birds. Once you have caught a bee, Wrap its head against a branch until it stops moving. <laughs> Next, rub the bee's tail against a branch to remove stinger and venom sac. Swallow whole or feed the chicks. <laughs> <laughs> it's that a wasp, hornet, or other flying insect may be substituted. <laughs> it had to learn all this, right? <laughs> Anyhow, this one is a little, uh, you'll say, wow. Amazing design, it's not very nice, but it really shows the fall, okay? This is the uh, interesting uh, relationship between the uh, tarantula wasp and the tarantula. Now, for those who don't like tarantulas, we don't see them much, but sometimes in different South America, they get this big. Those are big tarantulas, right? I haven't seen one that's like that at all. But... Uh, 
By the way, people just hold them in their hands. They don't hurt them. Okay? Little, let them crawl all over them. Not me. Okay? <laughs> but the, the wa tarantula wasp is rather intriguing. It'll actually engage that uh, tarantula in battle and sting it. And the tarantula wasp sting is, I've heard, is probably the most painful of all stings. It doesn't hurt to uh, kill you, but it's very painful. It really hurts for a, a little bit. But the, uh, it doesn't go after people. That's the nice thing about it. All right? But it does go after the tarantula. And it'll actually sting it and fight it. And it's got to sting it multiple times. And eventually, the tarantula, not dead, but paralyzed, okay? And uh, now can't move. And uh, so what happens is, now at that stage, the, uh, the wasp will actually lay its eggs on the abdomen of the tarantula. Okay. When the eggs hatch, uh, the little uh, maggots or whatever you want to call them, the larva, burrow into the inside of the tarantula. Oh, yuck. And it'll eat the entire inside of the tarantula. Oh, I know it. An animal over here. <laughs> yeah, really. But the interesting thing about it, it doesn't eat the vital organs right away. That keeps this tarantula alive. So it has fresh food. And so the very last thing that would be consumed at all would be the vital organs. How do they, how do the little larva know to do that, by the way, huh? Uh, well, that's what it does. So, again, a design feature, but also a feature that I think really indicates the fall, doesn't it? All right? There's a lot of things. We see a dichotomy. You can't understand beauty of design and why is there so many things that are going on, this eating, that, uh, things to poke you, right? Why? It really illustrates the fall, doesn't it? You cannot really explain the design features, even for a, in a university, without mentioning the fall. It's a package. It's a creation with tremendous design. It's the fall, which also shows why we have evil and suffering in the world. We, that's not God's fault. He knew what was going to happen. He allows, allows for it, doesn't he? And it was man's fault in the originally. Of the, in the fall, in the Garden of Eden, they, uh, where Adam and Eve chose to sin. Leaf cutter ants. It's interesting when you look at these uh, leaves like that, they're just chewed up. Some of them are chewed up. All right? That, something really like that flavor, I think. Look at all those things. That's the leaf cutter ant that actually did it. And what's it going to do with those uh, leaves that it cuts? It doesn't eat them. It takes them into its own then, you might say, buries them and lets them rot. They mold. And the ant, guess what? Loves the sticky fungus. This guy actually farms. And he's farming, making fungus here. But it's an amazing thing. It's a, it's a farmer ant. Uh, you know, other ants live in trees and, uh, all right. But one of the big enemies <laughs> would be the ant eater. All right, the ant eaters, we don't have them here in Colorado, I don't think, but it can eat uh, 25,000 ants per day. Woohoo, that's a big, major contender here, isn't it? So, what do the ants do? Some of them live underground, some of them are safe that way. Uh, others uh, uh, will actually uh, live in a very thorny environment. This is some of the trees. Now, how would you like to climb that tree? Mm. Huh? Now, I wouldn't want to climb that, that any one of those trees like that. But you know, there's a symbiotic relationship between the ant and the tree. If the ants love it in that tree because this, the ant eaters don't climb it. Okay? So they're protected. And uh, the ants actually pollinate the flowers of the tree. You understand? So the plant, the tree gives it protection, the ants give the pollination. I think it's a very unique system 
How do they learn how to do symbiotic relationships like that? Uh, um, termites also live up in those trees. Ant eaters love termites too. But you see that little uh, stripe that goes up that tree? That is actually a termite trail. They actually make mud like that and keep going up, 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 up. It's a tunnel inside there and that's where they go up and down and up and down. And so they stay protected as well. But they also live high up in the trees, okay? They live way up in that tree. Come on. <laughs> There's one of them right there. There's a termite mound up there, up high. And, uh, hmm. yep, I should have brought mine. All right, here we go. All right. Whew. Okay, I'm going backwards now. Hmm. All right, you can see where I'm getting to, aren't you? Okay, here's the termite mound uh, right here. There's one way up in the branches. Why would they go way up there with, uh, for something that usually likes to live in the ground? Dead vegetation, right? That's down there. It's because they're safe there, okay? They're safe there. One thing about termite mounds is that special thermal regulation systems again, okay? Uh, do you realize they keep the perfect temperature inside their little mounds? In Africa, they have mounds that are that tall. Great big termite mounds, all right? And the uh, engineers have been studying termite mounds. There's a building in uh, Minnesota, 30,000 square feet of building, and what they have done is look at the cooling system of a termite mound and applied it to their building. And they found out they don't have to cool it at all. Zero cooling bills, very little heating bills, okay? It's amazing. We can learn from what God has made. That's what I like about it. We're looking at the foot of a gecko lizard here, okay? Under high magnification, you find all of these different fibers, and they're so fine, there are 260 million of those per square inch. That's not very big. And they're so fine, they make a molecular bond with the surface that it is touching. And so it can run across a plate glass ceiling. And it has a funny little gate going like this when it's trying to go forward, but it can run right across there. Now, how did it learn to do this? Okay, we can copy that design too, can't we? They're making a new adhesive. They're hoping it's one-sided sticky tape or one-sided Velcro. And uh, what they're hoping to do is make a Spider-Man out of people. Give me a pair of gloves made out of this, it will run right up the side of a building. Uh, so I think it's a unique system, isn't it? Uh, amphibians, 175 species. Uh, guess what? Frogs are a good percentage of those. There are beautiful frogs in Costa Rica. All kinds of them. They're beautiful, but don't kiss them. <laughs> no, you know, you don't want to do that, okay? Because some of them are poisonous. Now these are not the poison dart frogs that you might find in Colombia. Columbia, they actually used to take that and tip their darts and their, their arrows with it. It was very lethal, okay? And uh, one, let's say, let's take a uh, one paper clip, uh, one five, one one thousandth the weight of a paper clip, and use that much of their toxin. It'd be enough to kill about 15 individuals. Don't want to touch those guys, right? It's interesting. Most of the time you can actually hold one of these in your hand. It won't hurt you. All right? But you don't want to eat it. All right? You don't want to eat it. You don't want to get it mad at you where it secretes this material. And that's what they did in Colombia. They actually put them into a, um, a reed, and then they prod it with a stick until the thing got mad, and it would secrete all their poison. And, uh, and then they dip their arrow shafts in there. And uh, that, that's a lethal hunting weapon, I'll tell you, and a uh, battle weapon. So anyhow, um, you think about it. Think about the poison in this thing. Again, the fall, isn't it? It is the fall. But you might ask one question. 
Why don't poison dart frogs poison themselves? Why don't they? They've been studying that. And part of the reason they're studying it is to try to make a medical advancement in cancer treatment. They're finding out it's effective. God puts things, even of a poisonous nature, for us to learn from, doesn't he? And we might be able to use it for medicinal value. But the reason they don't poison themselves is this. First of all, their toxin actually targets the um, muscle, the surface of the muscle, okay? And it blocks the um, sodium gateway. If you know, that's okay, that's pretty complex, uh, but uh, uh, that particular uh, thing which actually uh, it targets is a protein of 1,836 amino acids. It's a long string, that's a big protein, isn't it? And just to think, the probability of one small one is like finding an odd color marble in the universe three times in a row. All right, it's not going to happen. But now we've got one of 1,800 and 36 amino acids in this string. All right? And what that'll do is the, the toxin affects that particular chain right there. And it causes muscle seizures, etc., stops the heart like that. All right? That's what it was up. That, that's what it does. Why doesn't it poison himself? It's because the frog also has that long string except for one thing. There's one out of 1,836 of those amino acids that's different. And that one keeps it from being affected by that toxin. I wonder how many frogs had to f go through to figure this one out. <laughs> it's not gonna happen by accident, is it? It looks so, so designed. Well, every one of these design features we're talking about, I can go to the university, it doesn't phase them. You know why? They said, we can imagine how mutations working and uh, coupled with natural selection, the survival of the fittest, might produce these type of features. Do you know, imagine is not a scientific word. Did you know that? It's not a scientific term. And no, I, I can't imagine it myself, okay? How are we doing time-wise? I don't know. How, how long do you want me to go? No, I'll keep going for a while. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Anyhow. But you know what? Imagine is not a scientific word, but we use it all the time. That's what we hear. And that is naturalism, isn't it? John Sanford, who actually wrote the book called Genetic Entropy. Now, first of all, who is he? He is a... A geneticist has 25 or more, maybe up to 30 genetic patents under his belt right now. A co-inventor of the gene done for sequencing uh, the DNA. All this stuff. This guy's no slouch. He was an evolutionist. I just found out he was an atheist at one time. But he started studying and realized evolution didn't work. All right? <laughs> so now uh, he wrote that book and he said the primary axiom of evolution is this. Evolution proceeds by mutation and natural selection. He says, if mutation selection can't prevent the degeneration of the genome, then the primary axiom is wrong. It is not just implausible. It is not just unlikely. It is absolutely dead wrong. It is not just a false axiom. It is an unsupported and discredited hypothesis which can be confidently rejected. And that's what his years of research has shown. Okay? Mutation, natural selection doesn't work. And when we rely on all this, we have to understand evolution is really not science. Keep in mind, evolution is, nat is basically the pillar of naturalism, isn't it? The necessary ingredient for naturalism. And that is not a scientific theory. It is a philosophy of how we got here, isn't it? So evolution isn't science. And that's when I say that at a university, I duck behind the podium, right? <laughs> I really didn't know. You know, remember, 
Romans, right? Everything also fits into the creation, the fall, and the flood, and you've been seeing that. I think about creation, I look at some of the places in Costa Rica and I said, that's what it must have looked like at the beginning, right? So gorgeous, so beautiful, with uh, every little niche filled, every little place here. And even the evidences of the fall, great design that God puts into that as well. I see that. We see evidences of the flood in Costa Rica too. Uh, at one place, one of the beaches, we spend a, just a little bit of time there, or I have a, a great time to relax, actually. Uh, it turns out that uh, there's evidence of the fall. All those uh, uh, seashells right there, all massed together on this one ledge. And I thought, wow, there it is right there, all fossilized. And, uh, you know, keep in mind, this is one thing we have to understand. What we are looking at is the destroyed world. This is the world that's already been flooded by a major flood. And yet, what does it tell us? God can make beauty out of destruction, can't he? He can make beauty there. I, I love that, too. And that's enough to worship and praise him for, isn't it? What he's done in our hearts, what he's done in our lives. We can open up to him and say, thank you, God. You are a wonderful creator. We see evidence as well of the promise he gave after the flood, right? The rainbow. Yeah. Amazing. The promise. But we see evidence of dispersion as well. And dispersion. The ancient peoples of Costa Rica, by the way, weren't dumb. <laughs> Look at the, what they could make out of lava right, and uh, volcanic material. They made these huge spheres as well. <laughs> And uh, so they say, how do they make these spheres? I had somebody tell me, it must have been aliens that did it. <laughs> they said, we don't have that. They didn't have that kind of technology. But no, it wasn't aliens. Okay, we actually saw somebody making one. Okay. But they made them up to eight feet in diameter, these big, round, stone spheres. And then they moved them. They even moved them over to an island. Wow. They weren't dumb. They knew what they were doing. And uh, we find out that they had a, uh, a way of casting beautiful pieces of jewelry. They used what we would call today the lost wax method of casting. They had a forge as well that they used. All of this stuff, basically, what? Evidence that they were very, very smart, right? We knew the people before the flood were workers in metal, weren't they? They were smart back then. And these people in Costa Rica were not dumb either. There's a book that we have over here on the book table called Brilliant, Made in the Image of God, basically. And it really shows that the people, ancient peoples were extremely, extremely brilliant, okay? Well, you know, Costa Rica is a wonderful place for anybody who loves photography, <laughs> all right? I love it. Uh, Oscar here is our tour guide, loves it as well. Because there's so much beauty to photograph. The beauty in the flowers, the, uh, of course, there's color everywhere you look. The color, yeah. It could have been a black and white world, couldn't it have been? I praise God for the beautiful colors he put in, the flowers, even in crabs in Costa Rica. It's amazing, the, the, the colors that we see. Uh, the beaches that you just love to walk on and the beautiful palms and ferns and the, the lush vegetation. A lot of people say you think Costa Rica, think green. Well, it's an intense green. And then punctuated all over by these beautiful flowers, etc. Even the caterpillars, <laughs> even the caterpillars, intense beauty. And the beauty in the birds, the beauty everywhere you look. And then the ingenuity, God, this made with man, okay, to be able to make electricity out because of the water, right? Uh, he's done that. Uh, gorgeous spots, even a banana stalk. For those of you who know the hand of God, uh, Lanny, one of our uh, people, actually uh, wrote that there for, at our office. The Fibonacci sequences. Look at it. You see it in the banana stalk. You know, a great spot to see the diversity that you would never see virtually anywhere else around this world. I love some of those trees, like that one right there. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And with the volcanoes. 
monkeys are always fun to watch. There are four species of monkeys, and uh, they don't look like humans, by the way. Four species. <laughs> we see them all. Okay, we see all, of, all four of them. And what I said earlier, what tremendous diversity. Even in one tree, you find orchids growing there, bromelia, you find frogs. And by the way, that particular frog right there, it actually lives up in that tree frequently. It lives in the water below, but it actually goes up into the bromelia, which is on that branch on that tree right there. See that? This thing catches water. That helps the rest of the tree, by the way. But it also provides moisture for tadpoles. So they lay their eggs, they take those eggs up into their mouth and bring them up and they hatch them into tadpoles. Pretty unique, isn't it? Then they lay a whole bunch more unfertilized eggs and feed them to the tadpoles. Now, this particular thing actually, the mother or the whatever, who's ever feeding the tadpoles these eggs, a lot of that toxin has been transferred to the young tadpoles and the young frogs hatch with the ability to, to be a poison dart frog, okay? And it doesn't get it from its own production. It normally gets it from what it eats. So you can have a poison dart frog in captivity, by the way, and uh, when it's in captivity, it's not poison because it doesn't get the same food, all right? But they need to assure that they have the food so the young are born with that toxin because of the eggs. You think pretty smart guys. Why? Why, might I ask? Why am I, I, okay, why so much beauty? Why so much diversity, okay? I love the plants, okay? Why so much diversity? And I think the reason for it is God is an artist. He loves beauty. He put it. He loves painting. <laughs> All right? I can just see him taking great joy with some of the stuff he paints, right? Uh, doesn't matter what it is. Loves beauty. And he loves to paint his sky too, doesn't he? He really does. And uh, basically, some of the sunsets I've seen down there, I think God just love doing them. Okay? Love making those sunsets. All right? Anyhow, what a beautiful thing. So as we close here, let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for the beauty you have created, the design you have created. So we can look at it and we say, you are an amazing creator, God. Help us not lose sight of that. The design isn't there because of evolution. The design is there because you are a creator. You are a creative artist. Thank you for that. Now, as we think about you making beauty out of a destroyed world, making so much beauty for us to be able to enjoy, we thank you for that too. And we honor you. And we want to serve you as our awesome creator God. Thank you for allowing us to see so much. In Jesus' name, amen. A real brief commercial marriage I already told you. Coming to Costa Rica with us. Do you have a, they're going to give you a brochure, I think, that tells you about it, okay? So you may want to do it March 23 through April 1. one Did any? One comment on those brochures. Some of you got a, a, an old brochure with the wrong dates, I'm afraid. If you do not have the one with those snorkelers on the bottom right here, yeah, find one that says dates of March 23 to April 1. And we had to go with those dates because of the hotels we wanted to utilize. Uh, uh, there are certain ones that uh, fill up rapidly. In order to get those, we had to uh, uh, change our dates a little bit in order to do it. We also do a Yellowstone <coughs> creation tour. We just finished one up, and we're going to do another one over Labor Day weekend next year for your whole family. You might enjoy that trip as well. And the book table over here, uh, why don't you buy them all so I don't have to carry them over the mountain? <laughs> <laughs>
That would be good. Our DVD set only 35 bucks. Tell us about your conference in Colorado Springs. Oh, thank you. Yeah, next weekend, Friday nights, uh, Saturday, and also Sunday, we're going to do, be doing a creation conference at Colorado Springs, just off of uh, I-25 in Uinta, okay? And uh, it's at the Mesa Hills Bible Church. And uh, we start Friday night. There'll be two sessions Friday night. We'll have sessions uh, in the morning starting at 9 o'clock to about 2.30 to 3. And then we're going to take a creation tour of the Navigator's Headquarters, yeah. which is just half a mile north of Garden of the Gods with the same wonderful formations. And even better, we can show you the great unconformity there. Now, other things that Garden of the Gods doesn't have, but right there. And we would encourage you to come on up and take the tour with us uh, in the afternoon. Uh, let us know if you want to do it, uh, and we'll give you more information. Mary Jo? Some of you are familiar with Bill Hosh, and he will be part of that conference also. Yeah, yeah. Bill Hosh is, will be there as well. Bill okay. used to be with ICR. He was uh, their information mm -hmm. officer for a long time with ICR. Uh, you may not know of some of the latest materials available. This one by uh, John Sanford, remember? Uh, he and another guy teamed up on this book. It includes the latest on human evolution with great details, okay? Great details. That's John Sanford's book. We have that over here as well. Uh, interesting, day-by-day -day devotional. One little bite of creation every, uh, every day one page with scripture verses as well as uh, great meat to, to feast on on creation. And that's hardcover, I think it's $14 what that one is right now. Uh, guidebooks, if you know uh, the Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, Zion, this is a great series from a creationist perspective. Uh, really would be a wonderful Christmas present, any of this. Could be. You can do all your Christmas shopping here yet this evening, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Just give them something that's worth getting, not a tie. <laughs> they don't want any more ties. Uh, dinosaurs, books, uh, that's where kids get trapped in and believe in evolution and uh, start believing in naturalism. <clears throat> and uh, so some of the best materials on that. That's a picture of our building. Come visit, okay? Come visit. Thursday nights, uh, last night they actually had a uh, 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 well, every Thursday night we have supper, free for the college students, okay? If, if, but we have discussion along with it, and uh, so, uh, so what happened? That's the same university that uh, they determined I was too creationist for them, so they decided they had to get rid of me, and uh, they heard me tell this one time, but uh, they thought they had gotten, I was a goner. They thought I was a goner. But as the song says, but the cat came back. <laughs> With reinforcements now. <laughs> right there on the edge of Colorado Mesa University. Pray for our ministry there. Okay? We're still going all around, but we've added this. We have staff that really have excitement about doing campus ministry, both at uh, Colorado Mesa University, also at uh, the Grand Junction High School. And uh, so, which is just a short ways away too. So we're hoping that you will, uh, if you know of students that want to come to get an education, want to go to some college, and there are Christians and they lean toward creation, send them our way. We want to work with them the, during the four years, the eight, five years, or six years that they're going to be going to the university. And come alongside to mentor them, and hopefully when, they're, when we're all done, they'll come back into the community and be a force in creation in their own community. So, sum it up, discover creation, but worship that creator. Okay? Not, don't worship uh, creation, worship the creator. Okay, God bless you. Thank you so much, Bob, you, Can, or Rob. Do you want to answer questions? Oh, yeah, I'll answer questions now. All right. Let's uh, have a round of applause first. And 
because we're having pro problems switching the mics, normally we'd have a person come up and ask the question at the microphone over there. Uh, just but shout it out. Can you shout it out? As long as you tell me what they say. <laughs> okay. Can you repeat the question? I will try to. If, if Okay. Depends how long it is. All right. <laughs> Let's go for, you know. No, and how long that? the individual question is. Yeah. Well. More than three words I can't remember. <laughs> No. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, curiosity, how large is your staff now? Because I know you've got We several. have four speaking teams. Okay. Lanny and Marilyn Johnson do a kids program, children's program. By the way, they're going to be with us for an entire time we're there doing a children's <laughs> creation program right alongside ours. So there's children's ministry as well as uh, 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 students and adults. Okay, older students. Uh, and so we have four speaking teams. We have a small staff. We have a, uh, what is it? Uh, three quarter time secretary, half time bookkeeper, uh, and an administrator is actually also a teacher. Okay. Teacher, so there's actually five teams of teaching. Okay. So praise the Lord. We had many years just Mary Jo and I running around like a, you know, Lone Ranger and Tonto. Okay. <laughs> All right. I have a question. Yeah. I was wondering if you could describe what the great unconformity is all about. I know that's off the subject, but mm -hmm. it's... Um, the great unconformity is referred to the place where you have most frequently unstratified, unlayered rock, like the Pikes Peak granite, or other type of uh, nice and schist, it's a type of ge in geology. Uh, you have that type of a thing. Uh, and then you have layered rocks on top of that. So something got planed off and then redeposited. We see that also where it actually, you might even have some sedimentary layer, which we would call the uh, day three creation week uh, started rocks. Got, as things got broken up at the time of the flood, got tilted up, planed off at the flood, and then redeposited. The planing off contact zone is what we call the great unconformity. And uh, you see that worldwide, okay? And uh, people have used that as evidence that there really was a flood. And uh, yeah, it works. Okay? And we think that is the onslaught of that. Right on top of it has to be, happens to be uh, in like at uh, Cairo Springs, it's also around here, is a sandstone called the Sawash sandstone. The Sawash uh, sandstone is, uh, let's think about these layers of sandstone as pancakes. Okay? I get hungry when I think about geology. But they're pancake layers. They go for long distances sometimes. But in different areas, we have local geologists working with them. And the local geologists would look at that layer over here, and they'd give a name, Sawatch. Somebody else would look at the sandstone and call it the flathead sandstone, like what you find in the top of Moran Peak in the Grand Tetons. Or somebody else, like Dr. Steve Austin and others who work in the Grand Canyon, uh, the, G the rangers there, would look at the uh, Tapit Sandstone. And they have that name, a local name. But it's all of them I mentioned, part of the same pancake. They go, they're continuous up virtually, all the way from down in Mexico, through the Grand Canyon, across the Beartooth Range in Montana, the top of Moran Peak and the Tetons, all the way across Canada and north of Greenland. Okay, now that was the first layer that we see on top of the Great Unconformity, say in the Grand Canyon, and also at Colorado Springs. Okay, and, uh, and so that we believe was the beginning of the onslaught of the floodwaters right there. Okay, that was a short question, but a long answer. When I see these huge, broad layers, you know what it tells me? Global flood, not a local thing, okay? Any more questions?
Besides, when can we go home? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for coming out. And um, I hope this is the first time I gave this presentation, by the way. And so I'm uh, glad to be able to put that together for you and the group in the Twin Cities Creation Group. I'll be doing that one in uh, mid-October. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you so much. God bless you guys. Thank you.